Okay, please get started. Hi, my name is Alex Gutarin, and I'm going to kick off the presentation by talking about Netflix and our project, Open Connect, the content delivery net network for a delivery network, Netflix's content. And then I'm going to hand over the presentation to Scott, who's going to talk about the specific changes and improvements that we've made uh, to the FreeBSD kernel to support our scenario. So uh, what is Netflix? We're the world's latest, uh, leading internet television network. We have service available in over 40 countries. We support streaming our TV programs to over 1,000 devices. At this point, we have over 44 million subscribers that generate about uh, 1 billion plus viewing hours per month. And we're responsible for serving over 10 terabits per second of internet traffic. So with that number, we're actually one of the larger sources of downstream traffic in North America. This chart uh, from Sandvine Communications for the second half of 2013 shows that the Netflix traffic makes up over 30% of the downstream North American traffic at peak. It's a huge, huge number. And over 90% of traffic comes from our servers that run FreeBSD. So let me talk about uh, Netflix streaming for a little bit. Most, uh, I guess it's made out of three components. Uh, there's a bunch of things that run on Amazon Web Services. That includes the Netflix website, the web services that support uh, the interaction between the clients and the core components, recommendations engine, search, and also the pipeline that's responsible for the encoding and the encryption of the video content. Uh, the second group is the clients. We have a lot of client uh, applications. We're available on smart TVs, Blu-ray players, iOS, Android, pretty much any device you, you, you have. You can probably, if it has a screen and it's somewhat current, you can probably view Netflix on it. And then the content delivery network that uh, we're building is called Open Connect, and it's responsible for streaming the video content from the internet to your client. Previously, Netflix was using the three big uh, vendor content delivery networks, somewhat familiar names, Akamai, Limelight Level 3. Over the past two and a half years, we've built out our own content delivery network, Open Connect, and now we're serving pretty much close to 100% of our content from Open Connect. So you can think of Open Connect as a huge distributed web server serving content at terabit scale. It's a single purpose content delivery network designed just for serving Netflix content. We have presence at major internet exchange points uh, where we uh, peer with some networks and also use transit to get to other customers that are not yet peered with us. And we also embed our Open Connect appliance caches into ISP networks for the ISPs that want to bring their content even closer to customers. And the caches are available for free to the ISPs. We use off the shelf PC components. Uh, we have designed uh, two different high-density chassis that uh, serve our content. Uh, we use FreeBSD 10, we use Nginx for the web server, and we use Bird for BGP to announce what uh, NetBlocks each cache is responsible for. You can find more information about OpenConnect, including the list of our points of presence at openconnect.netflix.com. So this is a brief overview of our network architecture. Our goal is to bring the content as close to viewer as possible. So uh, we can give free caches to ISPs so that ISPs can save money on uh, uh, transit costs and also you know, serve content from within our network. Alternatively, ISPs have an option of peering with us at the internet exchanges or we can serve the ISPs that are not yet members of the Open Connect initiative over transit. Uh, we're able to gradually phase in our system and replace the third party CDN functionality. Over the past year and a half, I think we went from close to 100% vendor CDN to very close to 100% Open Connect. Uh, now let me talk about our hardware. We wanted to maximize the storage capacity. So we chose to go with the highest storage density possible, as many drives as we can fit into chassis. 
we designed the system to be as simple as possible, so we chose not to use RAID, and the drives are designed to fail in place. So if one drive fails in the server, it's perfectly okay. We just redistribute the content from that drive from other servers and uh, keep on going. After enough drive fails, then it's time for us to automate the server. We wanted to make sure that the boxes are power efficient, so we went with a fairly modest CPU and we generally try to be conscious of power use as we select the components. And we like to design our boxes so we can maximize network port utilization. As you know, even today 10, gig 10 gigabit ports are very much not cheap, so we wanted to uh, be as efficient as possible there. Uh, from the software design perspective, we're going for high performance. We want each box to be as efficient as possible, especially if we're given a box to an ISP and they're going to use their rack space to host our server. We'd like to be able to serve as much as possible from that box. Also, specifically for ISP use, it's very important that the boxes are just turnkey solutions. Generally, we'll ship a cache to an ISP or a set of caches. All that they have to do is plug in the power, plug in the network, assign it an IP address, which you can mostly do using an LCD screen, and the box ready to go. We decided to go with open source because we'd like to keep our dev team small and have a mutually beneficial relationship with the community. We generally contribute all, pretty much all of our changes back upstream. And we're trying to find vendors that are willing to uh, support us and work closely with us. Again, so we can offload part of the work to the vendors and have a close relationship with the vendor and so that also everyone else benefits from any improvements that we ask the vendors to make to their hardware the drivers. Uh, so what does an Open Connect server look like? It runs FreeBSD 10, like I said. It runs Nginx, Bird. We use NanoBSD for packaging. There's a fairly thin management monitoring layer, mostly Perl scripts, because they just work. And it's an uh, off-the-shelf PC. We have Xeon CPUs, several uh, 10 gigabit Chelsea ports. And uh, currently, we have two types of different chassis that we use. There's a 4U chassis that's designed for maximum storage. We have 36, 6 terabytes uh, new Helium drives in that, and 6 480 gigabyte SSDs that we use to cache more popular content within the server. For the more high density installations, mostly within internet exchanges, we also have a 1U server that goes light in storage, but can serve a lot of traffic. So it's a 1U chassis, and it has 14 900 gigabyte, 960 gigabyte SSDs. Uh, let me show you some pictures. So this is 24U servers, and it's about uh, four petabytes of storage capacity. Our library is quite big, so it's important for us to be able to uh, load a lot of our library into a fairly small number of boxes. Here's a picture of the 1U chassis that's about 30 servers right there, and that can serve from uh, 600 to 750 gigabit per second traffic. We designed our architecture to be scale, sca very scalable and resilient. Generally, for a small ISP within a metro area, we can ship them one appliance, which can handle you know, 10 to 20 gigabit of traffic and can generate over 80% offload for that ISP. At the same time, at our major IX points of presence, we generally put in you know, 20 to 40 to 80 caches. A, to cover the entire catalog, and B, to have enough replication available so that we can serve more popular content. So obviously the more popular content titles are replicated across multiple caches. Uh, the clients, the servers, and the control plane work together. The clients will switch away if the performance of a server is bad, or if the server dies. The control plane will take the server out of rotation if the server is overloaded or again, uh, you know, if it's no longer available. So this way we can be uh, fairly resilient to failures. And I guess one more upside that we have, given the intelligent clients and given that we're streaming a variety of bit rates, is that our demand is elastic. So uh, if we have a hot spot within a point of presence, we can just ask the clients to serve, to stream content on a slightly lower bit rate and this will eliminate the 
hotspot without generating outage. Uh, we try to design things so that we have minimal operation staff. I think the entire operations team that supports over a thousand servers right now is uh, six people and a manager and would like to keep it at roughly the same number regardless of the number of servers that we deploy. And uh, like I said, knock on wood, we haven't had a major outage in uh, over a year and a half that the system has been serving Netflix traffic. Uh, one more thing that I would like to highlight is that not all of the streaming appliances and not all of the streaming use cases are created equal. Uh, with Netflix, we're talking about a very long tail popularity distribution. So content is difficult to cache. There's over 400,000 files at a 4U appliance. Uh, each appliance serves between 5,000 and 25,000 client streams which equates to about 300 to 500 client streams per disk. Clients generally open multiple TCP connections during a single streaming session to try to overcome a, a congestion on the internet. We're trying to work with that to uh, make it a little bit more efficient, try to use a single connection. But right now, even a single client will, gen will open maybe between two and four connections per server. So that makes our job a little, a little bit more difficult. Since the clients uh, use adaptive streaming, they make fairly small HTTP range requests to servers. So even though a client may be watching a bit of content encoded at, uh, let's say, 3 Mbps, they're still requesting it on, let's say, 100 kilobyte chunks. So even though we're doing streaming, it's still a fairly decent number of requests that we have to serve. Uh, also, due to the adaptive bitrate streaming nature of clients, they fairly constantly switch uh, bit rates. So clients streaming from a stream can switch to either a higher bit rate or a lower bit rate almost at any time. Again, we, we try to minimize that, but because uh, the network conditions are unstable, clients switch around quite a bit. Uh, we attempt to buffer one megabyte of content ahead of which request, but caching is hard, both due to clients switching away and due to the fact that uh, we have an extremely long popularity tail. So uh, when you hear someone saying, well, my streaming server can stream you know, X gigabit per second, it can be an easier use case or it could be a harder use case. And I think ours qualifies as a, a somewhat harder use case. So at this point, I'm going to hand over the microphone to Scott and Scott will tell you all about the changes that the team has made to uh, optimize the server of Netflix content. Hi, can you hear me okay? Good, all right, thank you very much. So thank you, Alex, for the overview of Netflix. Um, I'm gonna talk about what we've done specifically in FreeBSD with Netflix. Um, I've given, given an evolution of this talk over the last year and a half. I apologize if some of this content is, uh, is repeat, but um, we're actually have been doing a lot of work just even in the last six months that I'll get to at the end that uh, everyone might hopefully find interesting. So to start off with, why do we use FreeBSD at Netflix? Um, basically because it's the right tool for the job. Um, all these reasons up here is fast, mature, it's great support, all that kind of stuff that's hopefully not a surprise to anyone in this room. Um, one thing that we do uh, stress is that we try to, um, bleh, sorry, one thing that, that we do stress is that we, um, we're happy not using the GPL. And it's not because we don't like the GPL, don't like Free Software Foundation, don't like Linux. I mean, a lot of Netflix does use Linux. Um, but it's just because, in our view, it helps us collaborate more. The, the, the BSD license is more, much more of a collaborative license. It doesn't build up the walls that the GPL does in terms of, you know, do we share, do we not share, are we compelled to share, all that kind of stuff. It, it makes us a lot easier to collaborate, and I think... Um, as I go through this, it'll be quite obvious where we've collaborated and where it's been very successful for us um, versus um, other companies that haven't been as successful when they're using Linux. So um, another thing is that we use FreeBSD because of its tight integration with Nginx. Um, FreeBSD has been the reference, reference implementation for Nginx for quite a while um, because of its async I.O. Uh, facilities and the Sun file 
system call that allows data to pass from the I.O. stack to the network stack without touching user land and without having all the overhead involved going in and out of user land with a read and write system call. So um, with that said, we started out with FreeBSD about two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, got it running very quickly. Uh, we went from a, 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 just a concept phase of, hey, we should do the streaming server thing and use FreeBSD on it, to actually having hardware in customer hands delivering video to customers in about six months, um, which is really amazing for this kind of a project. Um, and a lot of that was because FreeBSD just worked. Um, however, as time went on, we needed more performance. We needed to make bigger servers. So we had to start going through a series of, of improvement phases in FreeBSD. Um, one of the big ones was that we used multiple Ethernet ports on the machine, anywhere from two to four ports. And we wanted them to be managed as a single logical unit using the lag driver in LACP mode. And so we had to make some improvements there. Uh, the, by default, the LACP mode doesn't handle loss of, of partner heartbeats very well. It can wind up black holing your traffic if, say, the switch uh, goes catatonic on you and, you and you wouldn't know. So we made some, some uh, modest fixes there. Um, another big problem that we had was we discovered uh, coming up to a world IPv6 day in 2012, that we were generating enough IP, IPv6 traffic that there were some leaks in reference counting in the stack that were actually uh, rolling over fast enough that we could actually see them happen in a, in a weekend. And when those uh, reference counts would roll over, we would lose interfaces uh, and they would cause a panic. So uh, we fixed a few bugs like that. Um, made IPv6 a little more, re more, little more enterprise resilient for us. Um, next thing that we did was, at the time, we were using Intel Ethernet uh, 10 gig hardware. Um, and we saw that uh, the driver couldn't do LRO very reliably. Um, but all of our inbound traffic, almost 90% of our, or 99% of our inbound traffic was very small TCP acts. So we made some, some modifications that improved uh, efficiency in the receive path. We basically, those small act packets, we would just copy in instead of uh, sending them up wholesale in, in a full size frame and allocating a new frame and, and going through the old rigor roll of, of, of memory allocation. So, um, and the last thing is that we worked with FreeBSD Foundation and with Isilon to implement unmapped buffer I.O. Um, this was actually a very big thing for us because our data path with send file is all in the kernel. It never touches user land. It never really needs a virtual address map because our CPU never touches it. We, we don't do any transcoding on the data. We don't do any encryption on the data. We just get it off the disk, put it on network, and we're done. So we don't need a map, uh, a, a virtually mapped buffer. Um, getting this work done meant that we actually got a lot more scalability out of the VM, got a lot more scalability out of the CPUs because they weren't having to do inner CPU um, TLB updates, and it improved our performance pretty significantly. Um, the next thing that we did, uh, as Alex said, we try and focus on doing a lot of read ahead on the disk because disk transactions are fairly expensive, especially when it comes to a spinning disk. Um, Expensive because of, of head movements, ex expensive because uh, even a, a three gig or a six gig interface is not, um, not all that fast when we're talking about doing 10, 20, 30, 40 gigabits of traffic. So we try and do as much read ahead as we can. And what we found out was that by using the normal facilities for doing read ahead, we had this bimodal distribution graph of I.O. Um, and it was very confusing for us because we're asking for one meg, but yet half of our transactions are 64K. Our hard drives were getting beat up about it. We were, we were uh, really plateauing our performance. Um, and using DTrace, using, um, using DTrace, we actually were able to discover what was going on, that it was down in the VFS cluster code, that when you ask for one meg read head, it actually splits into, into these two transactions. So we worked around that by creating a new tunable called DFS uh, read min that basically says, for that first transaction, do all the read ahead then, and then turn off the second uh, transaction entirely. So instead of doing a 64K and a 1 meg, it just does a 1 meg and ignores the second transaction. Um, that made our hard drive performance a lot better, and uh, we were able to, to uh, 
increased overall performance. And one of the things that, that really limits our performance on these 4U servers with hard drives is not necessarily that we run out of CPU, is that we run out of hard drive uh, performance, that our latency on the hard drive starts jumping into the hundreds of milliseconds. Um, so this kind of work was very, very important for us in uh, being able to scale to more clients. Um, our second phase of improvement then started uh, in June of last year. Big thing that we did was we jumped from FreeBSD 9 to FreeBSD 10. Uh, about six months before FreeBSD 10.0 was, was even released. Uh, we did that because, number one, we wanted to stay on the leading edge of, of development, the leading edge of developer mindshare. Uh, we felt it was very important to not get not fall into the trap that a lot of other companies fall into where they stay on one release or one one set of releases and as time goes on they just stay on that because they're afraid to move, it's too much work to move um, and they wind up uh, becoming stale and, and, and losing that, that, that community input and developer mind share and just wind up fighting harder and harder battles to try and keep things up to date and working on, this old, on old releases. So. We wanted to avoid that, stay, stay up current as, as much as we could. Um, but also there was some interesting work going on in the system that we wanted to pick up too. There was uh, work going on at Isilon to improve the algorithms in the VM. Um, there was work going on in, uh, in Russia with uh, Glev Smirnov on per CPU counters for the system and making just basic network counters more scalable across CPUs. So uh, we did that. It was very successful. We only had a few hundred lines of diffs actually to, to port over. It, it only took about uh, total about three months to go from uh, scoping out the work to actually deploying servers with FreeBSD 10 on it. Um, and it was it was the start to our second phase of improvements. The next thing that we did is we started looking at hotspots in the stack with HWPMC. One of the big things that we, we that we saw was that the lag driver. Um, was having a lot of contention on locks, uh, or I, I should say not contention on locks, but was spending a lot of CPU time just going through locks. Because every packet had to acquire a lock, see if, see if the LACP configuration had changed, then drop the lock, then transmit the packet. Same with on the way back up. Um, so we switched the driver from using RW locks to using RM locks. Um, RM locks have a lot better CPU locality to them. They don't, they don't wind up, unless there's a contention problem, it, it, you know, unless, unless you actually have to take a writer lock and something changes, um, they're very cheap. The read, the, the read size is very cheap. It stays on, on the same CPU doesn't, and doesn't broadcast itself out to other CPUs like a Mutex does. So it uh, worked very well for us in this situation. Um, in the future, we would actually like to try and take it the next step and look at things like RCU um, to make the read side even cheaper. But for right now, ARM locks work well enough for us. Um, and the last thing that we did, or one of the last things that we did was we also switched over to using the flow table option in FreeBSD. Um, our, our routing table is static, it's very small, we just use a default gateway and let our switching infrastructure upstream uh, route out our traffic. So there was no need for every packet to be looking up routes on its way down. So switching to the flow table, at first we thought switching to the flow table would actually help us out. When we did it, it didn't help us out at all. Um, our CPU usage was still very high. Uh, once again, used dtrace and used HWPMC to look into it, and we discovered that the the, the uh, flow table scanner, the flow table cleaner, uh, was using uh, ON squared algorithm for doing its cleaning, and uh, fixed that very very trivially. Suddenly, we got another five or ten percent performance out of the system just by fixing that. Um, and all these changes that we've made, um, we've contributed back up to FreeBSD up to this point. So the next big thing that we had to look at was the page daemon. Um, we're doing gigabits of traffic per second. We're doing it all through, through VM caching. We're reading data off of this, putting it in VM cache, then coming back around with, with send file, and take point out of the VM cache, and sending it down to the network. That's really a very degenerative case for the mock VM in FreeBSD. It really wants to hold on to pages for a long time, it assumes that when you read something in that you might reuse it in the future. Uh, so it really tries hard to hold on to pages. We, we get very little reuse of pages uh, as we send them out because even though we might have 20,000 customers on a box, they're all watching different movies. Even if they're watching the same movie, they might be watching a few minutes apart of each other. 
whereas the most amount of time that a page can, send, can, 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 can stick around for us is a matter of seconds. So caching is, is very, very ineffective. Trying to, trying to keep the page around for later reuse is very, very ineffective for us. So we had this problem where the page daemon was really trying hard to do something we didn't want it to do. Um, we looked at the page daemon. It's, it's very complicated code. Um, it's walking lots of lists, and there are lots of side effects with that. Um, so our solution was to abuse SendFile. Um, what we tell SendFile to do with these highlight code snippets here is basically we dissociate the page from the, from the VM very quickly uh, before it, we even send it down to the network stack. And that way, by, by disassociating it from the VM and the VM object, as soon as that page is, is done on the TCP side of things, as soon as it's, it's been act by the client, it gets freed right away. It doesn't wind up in the inactive queue to be processed by the page even later on. Um, this was a fantastic thing for us. It, uh, pre previously, we would wind up spending 50% or more of a CPU just on the page daemon, chewing through pages, looking for free pages, trying to clean pages. After this change, uh, page daemon usage went down to single digit percentages. Um, and finally, the last thing that we did, uh, because we were now bypassing the page daemon and freeing things directly from the network stack on the destructor side of the network stack, um, suddenly uh, freeing MBUS became a lot a lot more expensive because um, even though we were bypassing the page team, we still had to go through the VM in order to free a page. And what we found was that um, there's, there was an increased amount of lock contention in the, in the network stack when uh, sockets were trying to, to throw away data that, that they had been successfully cleaned or successfully sent. So uh, Gleb Smirnoff uh, from Nginx stepped in, did some analysis, and came up with this new interface called SB Cut. Um, it's, an, it's an alternative to SB Drop, which it, um, would normally be used in order to uh, take data off of the socket that's already been sent. With SB Cut, basically it just returns a chain of data that could be, that, that could be freed. And then once you've dropped your locks, um, you can free it now uh, and uh, free it a lot cheaper, basically, than, than, than before. So with all this, um, these improvements, uh, our performance increased significantly. This graph shows a typical day in September, and where it jumps up at the end is where I, I, I have some sysctls that kind of control these, these different improvements. I turn them on, and you can see performance increased by you know 20% right off the bat. Um, so that was, that was great. That, that meant that basically we were getting uh, in money terms, it meant that if we if we were impre improving performance by twenty percent, that means that we were getting uh, for every four servers that we bought, we were getting a fifth server for free. So um, that that phase kind of ended up at uh, Euro BSDCon uh, two thousand thirteen last year, and we started our third our third phase of improvements after that. Uh, this is where we really started to collaborate a lot with the community. Um, we work with IX Systems and Alexander Moten on his direct dispatch I/O work. Um, he did all the heavy lifting. I, I won't take any credit for that. Uh, we did all the test, or we did as much testing as we could. Um, basically, what he did was uh, traditionally I/O in, in FreeBSD goes through the GM layer. The GM layer single threads everything through a G down thread and dispatches it to the network to the disk drivers. Then, when the I/O completes, uh, the disk drivers queue it back up to the G up thread where it's single threaded through. Um, this was causing us, for the amount of I.O. that we were doing, the G up and G down threads were, were consuming 10-15% of the CPU. Um, not to mention, not only were they consuming the CPU, they were also uh, serializing everything. We couldn't get any parallel I.O. out of the system. Um, the CAM ISR thread was doing a very similar thing um, as what the G up thread was doing. So Alexander basically multi-threaded uh, GM and CAM uh, took, uh, broke up some locks, uh, allowed the system to bypass these threads, and now I/O is much more like it was back in FreeBSD four and previously, where I/O gets dispatched from the file system and goes directly down to the disk driver. Um, and with uh, 
if your file system is is is, is multi-threaded, doesn't uh, have global locks in it, you can wind up having multiple CPUs working in parallel through the file system down to the I/O layer, dispatching I/O and completing it at the same time. Um, that helped us significantly once again uh, in the area. It, it didn't necessarily save us much CPU time, so much as it cut down on our latency of, of disk I/O. Um, we then took what Alexander had done in FreeBSD 11. We, we backported FreeBSD 10 because right now we're still on FreeBSD 10, even though 11 current is under development. We're still on FreeBSD 10. Um, we backported FreeBSD 10 and we put it to use. We're also now looking at um, most of his work was was focused towards the SATA drivers. Um, we're also looking now at taking his work and extending it to uh, like the LSI SAS drivers. Um, the second big thing that we did was we collaborated with. Dr. McCusick, here in the audience. Um, soft updates is uh, something that we, we use. Soft updates in journal is something that we, that we use extensively at Netflix. And, but there was a global lock in the soft updates code that um, serialized a lot of I.O. through the system. Let's uh, just put it simply that way. Um, we contracted with Dr. McCusick. He did some work on it and wound up multi-threading the soft updates code. Um, along the way, he also, we think, uh, contribute towards fixing a metadata corruption issue that uh, we had. Um, so once again, helped us out quite a bit. Uh, his work is actually in our tree. It's, it's pending to go into FreeBSD very soon. Um, and uh, they'll show up there as soon as possible. Um, next set of work that we're, we're working on is completely rewriting SunFile. Once again, SunFile is very critical to the operation of Nginx. Um, Nginx right now uses this two-phase process to dispatch I/O. What first thing it does is it calls send file to see if the if the pages are already in the VM. If they're not in the VM, then it calls AIO read to to initiate the I/O um, to be dispatched asynchronously, and then it goes on to the next request. Um, when the I/O completes, AIO read wakes up Nginx with the cake, you know. And Nginx then goes and calls send file again to send it out on the wire. Um, this works fairly well, but it's this complicated process of multiple calls into the kernel, um, lots of latency, and, and having to queue things to AIO and AIO threads, and then we will come back up again. So um, myself and Gleb Shmernoff are working on a new send file that is based on a new asynchronous uh, vNode pager. And the idea is that instead of sleeping on IO in the kernel, uh, it's all asynchronous and uh, completed with callbacks. So um, the hope we're still working on this. It's uh, just it's still in kind of early development. Uh, the hope is that at the end we'll have we'll be able to instead of using two to three system calls in order to issue an I/O, now we we'll only need one. That in turn will reduce latency, reduce system resources. Um, also, it reduces the possibility that pages will be evicted from the VM early on us because. Right now, when we read pages with AIO read, they get stored in the VM. Hopefully, they don't get evicted too soon. Uh, but if we're under high memory pressure, they might get evicted before we can even get back and have send file push them out on the network wire. So hopefully, this will solve that problem. Um, but one thing that the asynchronous send file relies on is being able to reserve space in the sockets. Uh, since we're basically doing asynchronous I.O., that I.O. can get out of order. It can, it can complete out of order. We might try and do one meg of IOs in, into a socket, but those IOs might get might get broken up down a lower layer and completed out of order. We don't want uh, those completions to wind up putting data into the socket out of order. So what Gleb has done is create a new flag for an mbuff that says, "I'm going to put this mbuff into the socket, but it's not ready. Don't send it yet." And what he does is, is then basically pre-populates the socket with mbuffs that are in the state. As the asynchronous send file then, uh, completes the I/O, he then uh, removes that flag from the mbus uh, in a corresponding fashion. And once everything is ready to go, then he sends a null mbus into the socket layer to basically kick it to start sending again. Um, it's a little bit of a hack, and it's something that we hope to get some feedback on once it's ready for for publication and and uh, and review for the kernel. Um, but uh, it's actually working very well for us right now, and um, 
by making more things asynchronous in the system, we're getting a lot more scalability. So hopefully we'll, we'll get some feedback on that. Um, other things that we're working on, uh, one of the big bottlenecks in the system is still the VM, even though we've, we've tamed the page daemon. Uh, just the free page list is, is a global lock and is a bottleneck for us. Um, especially as we add more CPUs in the system. Right now we're an eight CPU system. We're, we're evaluating and starting to deploy 12 CPU systems. That only makes the scalability of the VM worse. So we're working with Isilon. Uh, they have a, a very prototype patch for having per CPU uh, page pools. Um, and we're, we're working with that to make it uh, to port it forward to FreeBSD 10 and FreeBSD 11 and make it suitable for our use and for wider use. Um, once we get that solved, that's going to be one of the last big bottlenecks that we know of in the VM system, to making it be very, very scalable, very, very parallelizable. Um, and hopefully it'll benefit not just us, but anyone building a NAS appliance, anyone building anything that uh, relies on, on, uh, on VM caching and, and, uh, and uh, VM memory management. Um, another thing that we're working on is a quality of service framework into the system. Uh, right now, CAM only has a concept of a hard timeout. Either the I.O. succeeds in a certain period of time or it times out and we assume that's failed and the disk needs to be reset. Um, that doesn't work well for us because disks are designed to fail after maybe 60 seconds of, 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 of a timeout, but we need, the, we need to know whether that I.O. is, is going to be on time or late within a, a couple seconds. So we're adding a, a quality of service timer into the system where we can arm it for a couple seconds. If the I.O. has completed in that time, we could take some sort of mitigating action. We can, we can say um, maybe lower the queue depth so that the disk isn't thrashing as much, or we can just throw away that I.O. and, and reissue a new I.O. Um, or bounce that, that client to a different server where things aren't as busy, um, all without having to treat the disk like it's actually misbehaved and needs to be reset. Um, another big thing that we're, we're seeing is that about 1% to 2% of our traffic is retransmits uh, over the internet right now. Um, some of that's because people run crummy networks at home. They have Wi-Fi, they have cellular networks, they're using a microwave to pop some popcorn to watch their movie. Um, and that all, that all contributes towards packet loss. But another thing that we see is that we're going through congested networks, we're going through networks where there's a, a kind of an impedance mismatch where we're going from a 10 gigabit link to a 1 gigabit link or something even smaller. And as we're bursting out uh, 1 meg chunks to the, to the customers, these big bursts of traffic can wind up overflowing queues and, gain, and dropping packets. So we are working with several network vendors on this concept of packet pacing where um, we assign flow IDs to our transmit packets and if there's a big cluster of those transmit packets in a certain flow ID, the hardware will actually pace it out and put in gaps in between uh, individual frames. Uh, maybe just delay gaps, maybe interweave other, other flows into those gaps so that the switches downstream and your, your access point don't get hit suddenly with a huge uh, clustered chunk of, 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 of uh, packets that might need to get dropped. Um, another thing that we're working on uh, closer into the network is also uh, just overall stack back pressure. FreeBSD doesn't have a very good mechanism for uh, understanding high water marks and low water marks for when a network interface might be gained full. And uh, right now, generally, all that happens when, when you start overloading your network interfaces is you either wind up getting a lot of lock contention or you wind up dropping tra uh, packets on transmit. Either one of these is very good, so we would like to be able to tell the socket buffer that, hey, you know, there's only a little bit of space left while you only back off on transmitting right now or, you know, put in a delay or, or something like that. Um, and the final big thing that we're working on is actually having a cache in RAM for our really super hot content. Um, we have some algorithms that run on the box every 15 minutes that look at and see if there's a, a few titles that are really, really popular. Maybe it's a new, uh, new show release, new movie release that everyone's watching. If, if it picks up on something that's really, really popular, um, we'll actually lock that whole title into RAM uh, so it gets served completely out of memory and doesn't have to go to disk at all. And uh, we can wind up serving several gigabits of traffic just out of RAM that way, um, for the, you know, which then for uh, frees up resources on the disk and make, makes the whole system run better. So with all these improvements, um, working uh, 
about 30 gigabits now, actually. In some instances, we can get uh, close to 35 gigabits of traffic now. Um, I have an asterisk on this because this is all. This is also with some newer hardware with a little bit faster CPU um, and more RAM than what we originally had, uh, were using. But still, uh, we are getting very close to being able to saturate uh, four gigs of, of network link on a single box with useful traffic from the customers, um, which is which is great for our workload. As, as Alex said, you know this is streaming, but it's not streaming. It's actually a very tough workload in order to optimize for and we've pretty much come to, to the point of being able to saturate our network links. So uh, looking in the next few months, uh, once we complete our, our current phase, our next phase is going to look at things like CPU pinning, cache infinity, and looking at maybe it doesn't make sense to have all eight CPUs or all 12 CPUs doing symmetrical work. Maybe it makes sense to reserve a few CPUs to do some housekeeping, a few CPUs to do um, TCP, SINs, and ACTS and the rest of the CPUs that do data pushing. So we're going to look at that. Um, we're also going to look at the TCP stack. There's a lot of places where just algorithmically it's not very efficient. Locks are still being contended on. Um, and uh, up here uh, shows a graph from um, HWPMC that shows a hotspot in the network stack. Uh, one Interrupt thread is spending you know 35, 40 percent of his time just in the, in the TCP stack, trying to just chug through TCP input and TCP output. So uh, we're going to look at why that is and how we can make it more efficient. You know, ultimately we would like the the CPU to just be a traffic cop. We want to be able to direct traffic from the disk to the network stack with very little uh, processing overhead. So um, we're going to keep on working in that direction. Um, the other big thing that we're working on, we just hired Warner Wash. Uh, away from Fusion I.O. Um, we're going to use his knowledge and expertise of SSDs and flash memory to try and uh, make our SSDs faster, be able to both read and write the, at the same time so we could update content while we're serving it out, something that we can't do very effectively right now. Um, and beyond that, we're, like I said, we're always looking for ways to make the system more efficient to put uh, more traffic on a box or use more efficient uh, CPUs on a box. Um, so with that said, Netflix is hiring. If, uh, if you have an interest in helping us out, working on QA, working on test automation, working in system administration, um, come and talk to myself and Alex. We'd love to talk to you. So with that, any questions? Yes, Michael. Um, so the question was, is, is we use LACP and did we find that there was any um, conflicting implementations or problem implementations with switches at ISPs? And um, I think what we found for the most part, uh, Juniper and Cisco being the big switch manufacturers out there that we, we wind up bumping into, once we were able to fix the problem of, of uh, partner heartbeats uh, being handled correctly, whether they're there or they're not, and, and transitioning, transitioning the state machines to let you know whether or not to send packets down a certain link. Once we fix that, um, we've had very very few problems. Um, would you, can you think of anything else, any other problems we've had over the time? Uh, no, I, I think you described it uh, accurately. I need Actually, to turn it on. Most, uh, uh, most of our embedded caches do not use LACP. We just recently started uh, ship in the newer generation of caches to partners that use LACP. Uh, our model has been that the earlier hardware uh, that we used uh, at the beginning of the project, we transitioned that from data centers into ISP networks because generally they don't have as much traffic and those boxes just used individual interfaces and not link aggregation. But the few ISPs that do have LACP enabled have not reported any issues to us. Yes, sir. I would say that the primary goal of moving away from the traditional CDNs was to establish direct relationships with the ISPs, generally with our volume of data and uh, some of the 
uh, how shall we say it, interconnect issues on the internet, uh, having a direct relationship with ISP is a very beneficial thing to us. There are different agreements that uh, ISPs enter uh, into with the CDNs. Some, some ISPs demand that CDNs pay them, other, ISP, other CDNs refuse to pay, and we didn't want to be a uh, silent hostage to those disagreements and we just wanted to work with ISPs directly. We have realized some cost savings, uh, but I'm not sure if I can discuss exact numbers here, to be honest. So another thing is that we also want to be in control of, of our growth. We don't want to be beholden to the, to the uh, CDNs and constrained by, by their networks and unable to grow because they were unable to grow with us. Um, curious in what way. So um, we do our own custom or we contract out custom manufacturing of our boxes, and part of that custom manufacturing is that uh, we give them a USB stick that has our you now BSD FreeBSD image on it. Um, the factory uh, plugs that in, configures it for us, and ships it out to either our 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 co-location places or to the ISPs. Um, they may or may not pre-fill the box with content, depending on where it's going. Um, but it's actually, you know, other than just normal, you know, business relationship issues, it's actually a fairly, fairly easy process to get them to, to install FreeBSD and configure it for us. So we have an operations team. Uh, like Alex said, we have about seven sysadmins. Uh, we have a, a, a control backplane website that collects data from the from the systems and is able to push configuration changes out to those systems. Um, whether it's in our own exchanges or in ISPs, it all goes into the same <coughs> control plane and is managed as, as a group. It's homegrown, actually. Anything else? Yes, Eric. So we consider ourselves maxed out when the CPU is at about 20% uh, twenty percent free. Um, we're working on, on, on thinning that margin down, but, but we do need to keep some margin in because our control loop for sending clients to, to the box or shutting clients away from the box is somewhat coarse-grained, so there could be spikes uh, on a minute granularity of, of, of activity. So we, we want to make sure we don't totally saturate the CPU. So we, like I said, right now our, our, our aim is 20% free. We're trying to reduce that down to about 10% free by uh, reducing things like the page team and, and from taking up so much CPU. Um, on the, the all flash cache is what we call the Rev-D, that's 14 SSDs in it. Um, we're purely constrained by, by, the, by the CPU, spending time in the network stack and the VM. Um, on the, what we call the Rev-C, which is a mix of hard drives and SSDs, um, we're more constrained by the latency of the hard drives. Yes. <laughs> we are growing worldwide. I can't speak to you know specific strategies like that, but we are growing worldwide, and then hopefully you know someday soon we will we will reach out here. Uh, we spell the uh, BC client as iOS. Yes. There's a few things with sys controls, and, and, and we, we certainly tune our system. Um, things like max fizz, the maximum I.O. size, we tune that up to 1 meg, uh, whereas I think by default it's still 128K. Um, we, it's actually been on my to-do list to, to publish what our, our tunings are, and hopefully I'll get to that this spring. Um, but beyond that, uh, everything that we've pushed up so far is available by default or you know, with a well-documented knob.
Anything else? All right, well, thank you very much.